All right, uh, if you would turn your Bibles to Exodus chapter 1. This uh, quarter we are doing character studies, and last week we, we were talking about Shifra and Pua, and um, uh, I wanted to, wanted to finish that. We didn't quite get through that. Uh, so Shifra and Pua were the two women who were um, are called out in Exodus chapter 1 as midwives, uh, and they were the ones who Pharaoh commanded uh, to kill all the male Israelite babies uh, in order to uh, reduce, I suppose, the population of the Israelites in Egypt. Now, we talked, they probably weren't the only midwives, but they were probably um, at least in over charge of, of other midwives because by, by now the Israelites you know, were probably getting... Uh, close to, uh, you know, maybe a couple of million people. Uh, so it would be probably unrealistic to think that two midwives would, would serve the entire Israelite population. Nevertheless, uh, these midwives chose not to obey the command of Pharaoh. And so um, uh, he called them out for it and asked them why, and they told him. Uh, and so last week we looked at some lessons that we could learn from Shifra and Pua. And uh, do you remember any, any of those lessons that we can learn from these two women that we discussed last week? Be brave. Be brave, right? Confront your fear. Uh, exactly. Um, because they would have known that Pharaoh was going to, to call them out and, and say, hey, why have you disobeyed me? Uh, they, they would have known that ahead of time. And, uh, and so... They decided to, they made the conscious decision to, to disobey him uh, regardless of whether they were called out. And so uh, we, need to be, we need to be brave. Um, so, um, you know, fear is one of those things we talked about that, that paralyzes people, uh, paralyzes Christians from doing things that, that maybe they should do. You remember in uh, Matthew chapter 25, the parable of the talents, uh, and, you know, they had the, the one talent man, the, the two talent man, the five talent man. Uh, the one talent man, he decided he wasn't going to, to use his talent, but he was going to bury it. And uh, he said, Lord, he says, he says, I knew you to be a hard man, uh, reaping where you had not sown, uh, gathering where you had not sown. Uh, sown or a straw uh, seed. And he said, I was afraid. I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. And here it is. Here it is for you. Here's your talent. And you remember what the, what the Lord, the master said to, to that servant? He says, go ahead. Well, he said he could have at least earned interest on it. Okay. Do you remember what he called the servant? Yeah, he says, you wicked and lazy servant. You wicked and lazy servant. God didn't, or uh, the Lord didn't uh, accept the excuse um, uh, that he offered. He offered, he said he was afraid. Whether that was the case or not, I, I kind of doubt it. But being fearful was not, was not, um, was not a valid excuse. And um, also in Revelation... See if I can find it here. I will find it here. Can't find it there. Revelation 21, verse 8, says, uh, gives a list of, of, of people who will not be in heaven, who, who will not be uh, who, who will, well, let me just read it. But the unbelieving and the abominable, uh, murderers, whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. You know, we think of those people, murderers, liars, whoremongers. Um, you know, yeah, they, they deserve that, right? Um, but I actually left out the first one in that list. And what is that? Fearful. The fearful, right? Those who are cowardly. 
um, they will also uh, be clumped in with those people who will not uh, have eternal life, the, the fearful. And so as Christians, we need to be uh, careful that, you know, we're, we're not using that, that excuse of being fearful, of using our talents uh, in order to grow spiritually, in order to help others uh, grow spiritually. God will not accept that as an excuse. All right. What other lessons did we learn uh, from Shifra and Pua last week? Don't lose sight of our purpose. Don't lose sight of our purpose. That's right. Um, they were midwives, and midwives' purpose was to bring life into this world, not to, to, not to take it out. And so they, they didn't lose sight of their purpose, and they weren't distracted uh, from their purpose. As Christians, we got to be careful that we're not distracted from our purpose. We live in a, in a very rich and wealthy country. We have so much um, time uh, on our extra time on our hands uh, in this country that sometimes it's easy to get distracted. We shouldn't let our jobs distract us. We shouldn't let our hobbies distract us. Uh, we shouldn't let our relationships with people distract us. Uh, and so uh, we have to be careful not to be distracted from our purpose. Good. What else did we learn from them? That's right. God's law supersedes man's law. All right. Good. So um, there are times when, you know, uh, our civil law may conflict with what God's law says. And, and when that happens, we're going to have to um, make the decision. As Christians, we should make the decision that God's law supersedes uh, man's law and that we're going to obey uh, God rather than man. And, uh, of course, we cited the examples of uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, of Daniel, of Peter and John. Um, in Acts chapter 4, all made the conscious decision to obey God instead of man. All right, what else did we learn? Maybe that was it. Maybe that was all the lessons we covered. Uh, one thing I, you know, we, we need to learn from them is, is that God blesses the, the obedient. God blesses the obedient. He blessed these midwives with, with families, with households of their own, not because they lied. Or, and we talked about that extensively last week. We're not even sure they did lie. But uh, some people will claim that they lied, and God blessed them for that. But that's not the reason they, that he did bless them. He blessed them because they feared him. Uh, and they, they obeyed his law and not Pharaoh's law. God blesses the obedient. God will bless us. And though it may not be easy to take that path, um, you know, they could have ended up dead. Pharaoh had all, all, all authority, all power. Uh, he could have had them killed, and, and, um, and that would have been the end of, the, end of them. But... Um, God blesses the obedient, and they believed that, apparently, and uh, decided to do what was right, regardless, regardless of the consequences. I think one other thing that we learned uh, from them is that we need to seek godly professional companions, if we at all possibly, possible can. These two women probably relied on each other for strength, especially in making such a, a monumental decision. And so, you know, the, the more that we can have godly companions uh, close to us, especially in, in the workforce, and I know that's not always easy, uh, not always possible, but uh, the more that we can get uh, godly people around us and surrounding us uh, that can support us, the better off that, that we're going to be. All right, um, and then I think one other thing is, you know, maybe the, the most obvious lesson that we learned from Shifra and Pua, and that is that we need to revere life, that we need to revere life. We need to appreciate and respect the sanctity of life, and we need to do that because we're all created in the image of God, and so it doesn't matter whether we're poor, whether we're rich, whether we're old, uh, whether we're young, um, whether our skin color is one 
one color or the, or the next. All men, all women are created in the image of God. And because of that, we need to respect uh, the sanctity of life. We need to uh, understand that all people are, are important. You know, in the last few months, there's been a, a lot of news about medical abortion. And even this past week, we've heard a lot about it. Medical abortion, you might uh, know it, uh, we, we know it as the, uh, the abortion pill. There's two types of abortion. Uh, there's clinical abortion, and then there's medical abortion. Clinical abortion is where you go to a, a, a clinic, a, a medical office, and have an abortion performed. Uh, medical abortion is, is something you can do at home. Um, it's the abortion pill. And so uh, a, fe uh, a federal judge in Texas last week, he uh, ruled that uh, the FDA had improperly uh, uh, approved the abortion, uh, one of the medications that's used in medical abortions uh, 20 years ago. And so uh, there's been a lot of opposition to his ruling. Uh, and, and, you know, it, it's possible that that drug could not, not be um, uh, used any longer. And so those who are abortion advocates have really uh, been vocal about their opposition to his ruling. Uh, but, you know, here's someone who, who reveres life. And I went on um, Planned Parenthood's website, and they have a, they have a three minute video uh, that explains medical abortion. You know, it was, it was really disturbing. It was very disturbing. I, I consider myself to be someone who has a strong stomach, but I was physically sick after listening to that video. Um, the, the, the tone of the, the, the moderator the, was, was just uh, so casual when, when they're talking about, you know, aborting uh, a, a fetus. Uh, they talked about the, the process and, and they talked about, you know, the length of time that it took. I'll spare you all those details. But, um, you know, it was, it was very disturbing. Uh, she said, abortion is very common. It is also very safe, and, and serious problems are rare. And sometimes the decision to have an abortion is simple, and other times it's, it's complicated. You know, she, they want to normalize abortion. And, and, and so, um, you know, they, they calmly speak about it. Uh, and, you know, they said things like, um, you know, you can do this at home or, or wherever you're comfortable uh, and you can rest. You know, it's all about, uh, it's all about the mother. It's all about the, the mother and, and has nothing to do with the, the fetus, the child. And so, um, um, you know, obviously you all understand the, you know, the way our country has, has gone and and the views that many of them in our country take about this. Um, medical abortion is, is legal in, in 37 states. Um, some states require a prescribed physician to do it, others, others don't. Um, some just uh, require clinical uh, 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 pres uh, prescription. But it's banned in 13 states. And you know, this is something that we need to, we need to pray about. We need to pray that you know more, more people in positions of power um, take the stance that this federal judge took last week, uh, that they have the, the courage to do that. And uh, you know, I admire someone like that. I don't know who this man is. I don't know his religious background or anything about him, but he, he's to be admired for his courage because he knew that he was going to, to be taking um, a lot of flack uh, for the decision that he made. Um, and so we need to, we need to revere life. Um, we need to, to hold it as, as something that's sacred. And, um, you know, the, these two ladies, these two women, Sifra and Pua, they did that. Um, they, uh, you know, being a midwife, I think the implication is, is that you really care about 
mothers and I care about their babies and, and that's the kind of work you do because you, you do care. Um, it must have been difficult for them to have gotten that command from Pharaoh you know, to, to do just the opposite of what they were probably not, would naturally do. And so um, you have to admire them for that. Comments, questions? So, um, you know, we, we, need to, we need to be upset. You know, the Bible tells us uh, be angry and don't sin. You know, I think this is one of those topics where, you know, abortion should anger us as Christians. Um, we should be angry. We shouldn't sin in the process of that. Uh, uh, of, but we should, we should be angry about that and uh, certainly pray about it. All right. Um, I think that's uh, I think that's all that I had on Shifra and Pua. Anybody have any other comments about these two women? If not, uh, just turn the page and we're in, in Exodus. Go to Exodus chapter two, and we want to talk about Jethro. Jethro. I've entitled this lesson um, Jethro, the model in-law, the model in-law. I know not all of you are here, here probably have in-laws. Maybe most of us sort of had in-laws. Um, in-laws kind of get a bad rap sometimes, right? <laughs> um, is that right? We're in-laws. Yeah, we are. But we never have. We get that out. We no. <laughs> Maybe you do. Um, no, every in-laws do get kind of a bad rap. But um, you know, as we look at Jethro, I want to I want to take a look at some of the characteristics uh, that make him uh, just a good guy. Uh, so uh, let's read uh, verses uh, eleven through. 15, please. Someone want to read those for us? What chapter? Exodus chapter 2. One day when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and looked on their burden, and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. He looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. When he went out the next day, behold, two Hebrews were struggling together, and he said to the man in the wrong, why do you strike your companion? He answered, Who made a prince and a judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, Surely the thing is known. When Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Thank you. Uh, so Midian is on, uh, it's actually, if you think about the the, the the um, Red Sea, and has those two fingers that pop up off the top of it. Uh, Midian is actually on the east side of the, the Gulf of Aqaba, uh, which is, if you're looking at the map, it's the one on the right. Um, so it's, it's actually on the east side. And, and the Midianites were, um, were actually interrelated with the Israelites. Do you know how? Diane? Okay, so if you remember Abraham, after Sarah died, he remarried, uh, and his wife's name was Keturah, and uh, they had six sons uh, together. So um, one of them was Midian, and so these people, uh, Jethro was a, a descendant from uh, one of Abraham's uh, sons by Keturah. And um, it says that uh, he took, he took, uh, he dwelled in the land of Midian, and in other words, he, he took up uh, temporary residence there. And, you know, no doubt God was guiding Moses uh, from Egypt to Midian to meet up with Jethro, you know, to prepare him for, you know, uh, things to come. But um, let's also read uh, Exodus chapter 2, 16 through 18, please. Now the priests of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water. 
and they filled the troughs. They filled the troughs to water their father's flocks. Then the shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flocks. When they came to Ruel, their father, he said, How is it that you have come so soon today? All right, thank you. So Jethro had another name, Ruel was his other name, um, and he asked his daughters a question. How is it that you've come so soon today? So the first point I want to uh, look at about Jethro is that Jethro was a, uh, a mindful father. He was a mindful father. Um, you know, he knew where his, his daughters were supposed to be, and he knew when they were supposed to be there. Uh, and he asked them this question, why have you come back so soon today? Um, you know, sometimes it's easy for us as parents to get busy and to just, I'm not saying we neglect our children, but uh, maybe not be as um, mindful of them and where they're at and who they're with uh, as we can be all the time. Uh, and it's something that we need to be careful of as, as parents. You know, I think of the, the kings in the Old Testament. You know, you'd, you'd, have a, you'd have a good king, and then their son would be a really wicked king like uh, Hezekiah and Manasseh. And, um, you know, Manasseh was the worst, right, the king that, that Judah had. And, um, you know, you, you ask yourself, well, how'd that happen? And undoubtedly, it's probably because uh, the father's influence uh, wasn't there. I mean, perhaps they were too busy uh, to spend time with their children. I mean, there are other reasons, but, um, you know, we see that. We see that there's a good king, we see, and then the, their son was a bad king, or vice versa. Uh, it's because the parent's influence wasn't there. And so um, we, we need to make sure that we don't lose track uh, of our children. If you would turn to, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Yeah, it doesn't say that, okay. but, um, you know, it just makes you wonder why, um, you know, how could you have such a good king who followed God and then have such a bad king afterwards? And it, like I said, there's lots of reasons. Like, even in the church today, like, you'll have kids who, like, go astray, and you're like, oh, why'd they do that? It's, it must be the parents. They must have not. And mm -hmm. sometimes you can have the best parents in the world, and the kid still ends up going astray. Right. Like, it's not necessarily the parents' fault, but I think no. I've heard that a lot in the church where it's like we blame the parents for the kids. I'm like, sometimes that's, that's truly it, but sometimes it really does fall on. You have to take away, okay, it's not just the parents. That kid is an individual, too, and they make those choices. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and there's a number of reasons why children go astray. Um, but sometimes it, it's just the fact that parents aren't influencing them as they should, uh, not teaching them. So... Um, yeah, you're right. Okay, First Corinthians or First Thessalonians, chapter two, uh, verse uh, verse eight. Now, in this chapter, Paul is writing to the Thessalonians, and he's reminding them of how he acted uh, when he was in Thessalonica. If you remember, uh, Paul, in Acts chapter sixteen, Paul and Silas were in Philippi. They were in prison, but when they got out, they went on. And, and one of the places they went after that was Thessalonica. And so Paul's reminding, he's writing to them now, later, but he's reminding them of that time that he was personally there with them. And so he says in verse 8, So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but our own selves, uh, our own souls, because you were dear unto us. Um, Actually, the verse I wanted was verse 7. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. Uh, that, that's a, you know, uh, an indication of a, a nursing mother cherishing her children. Um, and then jump down to, to verse uh, 11. As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children. So he's reminding them of how he conducted himself with them. And he uses the example of a father, a mother and a father. And he's, he just takes for granted that, you know, they know this is how a father is supposed to, to act. This is how a mother is supposed to act with their children. You know, the three things he mentions in, in verse 11. He says, 
Fathers comfort their children. Uh, they, they, are, they exhort their children. They, in other words, they encourage them. They comfort their children, and they charge their children. In other words, give them instruction on, on how to go. You know, that's what he was saying he did with, with the Thessalonians uh, when he was there. He exhorted them, he comforted them, he charged them, and he cherished them. And, you know, I kind of believe that that's, that's how Jethro was uh, with, with his uh, children. Diane? I just had another example besides the kings. Um, Eli, the judge, and Samuel, they didn't do a very good job with their kids. They didn't restrain them from doing things that were wrong. That's right. Eli, the, the, the priest, you know, he was told by, by God, you know, you need to, ch- you need to correct uh, your children. You need to discipline your sons. He didn't do it. Uh, Samuel sort of followed in that same, those same footsteps with his children. And so, um, uh, yeah, good examples. Anyone else? So I think Jethro was, you know, in my mind, anyhow, he's the kind of father who did, uh, he did his role as, as a father. He was a mindful father. He, he cared about his children. Um, someone read verses 19 through 20, please, of Exodus chapter 2. And they said, An Egyptian delivered us into the hand of the shepherds, and also drew water enough for us, and watered the flock. And he said unto his daughters, And where is he? Why is, he, why is it that ye have left the man? Call him that he may eat bread. All right. So what, do you, what, what lesson can we learn from Jethro here? He was a hospitable man, right? He was a hospitable man. Uh, hospitality is, is, is uh, commanded and, and commended throughout the Bible. Uh, in Leviticus 19, the Israelites were said, they were told by God, if a stranger comes to live with you, in other words, a foreigner comes to live with you, is content to dwell with you, you know, you treat him, you treat him well. You don't treat him poorly. Um, he says, you... He says, a stranger who dwells among you shall be as one born among you, and you shall love him as yourself, for you were strangers in the land of, e- of uh, Egypt. And so they were commanded to be hospitable. Uh, where else are we uh, hear hospitality taught in the Bible? That's right. Uh, Hebrews uh, chapter 2, no, chapter 13. Verse 2, chapter 13, verse 2, entertain strangers for some have entertained, uh, let me read that. Some have entertained angels unaware. Yeah, don't forget to entertain strangers for, yeah, yep, very good. Where else? Yep, elders are supposed to be hospitable people, all right. Christians are told to be hospitable, Romans chapter 12, 1 Peter chapter 4, uh, you know, the early church's start depended in part upon hospitality, Acts chapter 2 uh, and, and Acts chapter 4. Uh, and so hospitality is something that is uh, highly commended uh, and looked upon in the Bible. And, and, and Jethro was a hospitable person. All right. So I want to read verses uh, 21 and through 22. And Moses was content to live with the man and he gave Zipporah, Zipporah, his daughter to Moses, and she bore him a son. He called his name Gershom, for he said, I have been a stranger in a foreign land. All right, thank you. So Jethro was a man that Moses could live with. Um, in your mind, I don't want you to answer, do you think you could live with your in-laws? Okay, that didn't sound really <laughs> like you enjoyed it. Um, okay, all right. So, you know, in-laws kind of get a bad rap, and, you know, I, I think, yeah, I could probably live with my in-laws, um, at least for a period of time. But Moses lived with his in-laws for 40 years. You know, Jethro was that kind of a person that, that Moses could live with. Now, Jethro didn't give Moses, you know, the immense wealth of, of Egypt, um, but he gave him what he needed. He gave him a, 
He gave him a place to live. He gave him a wife. Uh, and he gave him a job. And so Moses was con content to live there with him. So um, as Christians, we should be people who, st who strive to be like Jethro, uh, easy to get along with. And, um, and especially um, as you become in-laws, if, if you're not already. All right, comments? I think another thing we can learn is that he was grateful. I mean, going along with the hospitality, uh, when he learned that Moses helped them, he wanted to, to me, I think that would be like a, he's thanking Moses for helping his daughter. Absolutely, absolutely. So. Uh, grateful, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I never had daughters, but I'm sure there were times when, when people helped our, our sons, and yeah, you know, that's something to be grateful for, and we need to express our, our gratefulness to, to people who, who help us out and assist us. Good. I thought you were going to say in verse 20 that it's biblical that he should, any man that has daughters should meet the guy that did <laughs> Oh, you think, you think Jethro had an ulterior motive? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, maybe he did. Um, so um, let's go to um, verse 18. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, chapter 4, verse 18. So in chapter 3, all of chapter 3 and half of chapter 4 gives us the account of Moses um, up on the mountain uh, in, in front of God by the bush that wouldn't burn. And so, the, verse 18 of chapter 4, um, someone read that. Moses went and returned to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said unto him, Let me go, I pray thee, and return unto my brethren, which are in Egypt, and see whether they be yet alive. And Jethro said to Moses, Go in peace. All right, so... Um, you know, Jethro rehearses, I'm sure, what God had told uh, him to do uh, with Jethro. And he asked Jethro's permission to go and, and go back to Egypt. And Jethro simply said, go in peace, go in peace. So well, I think the lesson here that we learn is, is that um, Jethro put God's purposes ahead of his own. Uh, you know, it probably was a, a big inconvenience, to be honest with you, um, for, to have Moses leave, you know, he was taking care of the sheep, you know, and, uh, you know, so Jethro would have had to have found somebody else to do that work. Uh, Jethro assumed responsibility for uh, Moses's family, and, and so, um, but yet he was willing, he was willing to put God's purposes uh, before his own. He, he didn't try to talk Moses out of it, uh, he, he simply said, um, go in peace. And so Moses did. All right. Um, Moses didn't take them with him. Moses took his family with him. Yeah, he did at first, and then they came back okay. to him. Yeah, you're right. But, yeah, in verse 20, um, you know, so it, it, it wasn't at that particular time that he re assumed responsibility for his family, but later on he had to. So, yeah, thank you. All right, um, verses eight, let's jump to chapter 18. So, between chapter 4 and chapter 18, uh, Moses goes to Egypt and um, he confronts Pharaoh and then he, he leads the people out of Egypt. So, let's read... Uh, uh, one through six, if we can, please. And Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel and his people, that the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her back, with her two sons, of whom the name of one was Gershom, for he said, I have been a stranger in a foreign land. And the name of the other was Eleazar, for he said, The God of my father was my help, and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife to Moses in the wilderness, where he was encamped at the mountain of God. Now he had said to Moses, I, your father-in-law Jethro, am coming to you with your wife and her two sons with her. Thank you. So, 
Um, here, uh, Jethro brings them back. Um, and I don't know how far of a trip that was for Jethro, but again, it was, you know, it took some effort on his part to do that. Uh, Jethro understood the, the benefits of family. You know, he, he didn't say, oh, forget about that Moses guy. Um, you know, he took off to Egypt and he's got some other job now. Uh, he wanted to reunite his, uh, his daughter and, and grandsons with their father. And so, um, you know, he understood the benefits of family. And then in, in verses 7 through 12, it says, So Moses went out and, uh, to meet his father-in-law and bowed down and kissed him. And they asked each other about their well-being, and they went into the tent. And Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake, all of the hardship that had come upon them on the way and how the Lord had delivered them. So I think one thing that we learned from here from, from Jeth, uh, about Jethro was that he was an example for Moses to honor and respect. You know, and, and I think as uh, older people, well, even younger people, as Christians, we need to, be, we need to strive to be uh, examples that people can honor and respect. You know, I don't know what your, what your fellow workers think of you. Uh, I don't know what your family members think of you. Is it, is it, do they think of you as someone to honor and respect? Um, do, they, do they think of you in some other uh, opposite way? But we need, as Christians, to, to always strive to be the kind of people that, that uh, people can honor and respect. They not, may not agree with us, um, but they can, they can certainly respect us. And, and as, you've, as you've heard people t say, they would probably, they would rather have people respect them than, than um, to, to like them. And so uh, we need to, to follow the example of Jethro and, and be the kind of people that can honor and respect. All right, thank you very much. We'll pick up there next week.